You've probably noticed over the past couple of weeks that Saudi Arabia is throwing a lot of money at football. Even prior to recent weeks, the kingdom acquired 80% of Newcastle United, has signalled an intention to host the FIFA World Cup, and made Cristiano Ronaldo the highest paid player in the entire history of the sport, but now things have got really crazy. Angolo Kante and Karim Benzema have joined Al Ittihad on contracts reported to be worth 100 and 200 million euros a season. Lionel Messi was offered double that amount, 400 million euros, to join Al Hilal, and several other superstars look likely to follow in Ronaldo Kante and Benzema's footsteps after the PIF which is Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund, which also owns 80% of Newcastle United, recently acquired majority stakes in Saudi Arabia's four best-supported clubs. Neither Saudi wealth nor interest in sport or football are anything new. Indeed, I made a video on exactly that topic a little over 18 months ago, after West Brom midfielder Mateus Pereira chose to join Al Hilal ahead of West Ham and other Premier League offers, but this is investment, on an entirely different scale. To put it into some perspective, the 200 million euros a season that Saudi Arabia will pay Karim Benzema is over twice as much as any footballer in Europe has ever been paid by their clubs alone. It is more than the entire annual budgets of seven different Premier League clubs in by far the world's highest spending division, and it is the same as the entire salary cap of $208.2 million set for every NFL team in the 2022 season. That's right, Karim Benzema alone is paid as much as any NFL team. At Real Madrid, by contrast, Benzema was paid around a paltry 12 million euros a season after tax, and if using after-tax figures seems like an unfair comparison, don't forget that there is no personal income tax in Saudi Arabia, so a salary of 200 million euros is just that. Messi's contract offer, meanwhile, whilst it was rejected, would have been not just by far the most lucrative in the entire history of world sports, but would actually have been worth more each season than the amount that Saudi Arabia paid to buy Newcastle United in 2021. Clearly then, this is quite a big deal, but the question remains, just how big? Is this a fleeting phenomenon akin to the NASL in the 1970s? A doomed project like the Chinese Super League during the 2010s, or the reshaping of the global football landscape, which will see the Saudi Pro League challenge and, perhaps even eclipse, the likes of the Premier League and the UEFA Champions League. And whatever the outcome, why is this happening? Why has the intensity of spending ramped up so extremely over such a short period of time? And what is the end game in all of this for Saudi Arabia themselves? Well, sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to the birthplace of Islam and the largest country in Western Asia, where 95% of land is desert, witchcraft is still a crime, and dissent can be deadly, as I attempt to answer all of those questions and more. In the same week that Al Ittihad unveiled the signing of the reigning Ballon d'Or winner, Al Hilal offered Lionel Messi roughly a billion dollars over two seasons, and Saudi Arabia's three biggest clubs were taken into state hands, the PGA Tour merged with its Saudi-backed rival Live Golf in what was viewed by many as being a capitulation by PGA and a huge win for Saudi Arabia and their sporting expansion. That inevitably led to comparisons between Saudi Arabia's realised influence in golf and their intention to make similar inroads in football, with some people speculating that it's only a matter of time before football's current authority figures and organisations would buckle in a similar fashion. Football and golf are entirely different ball games, though, quite literally, of course, and I don't just mean in the sense that the ball is much bigger in football and it is a bit more difficult to become an all-time great on a diet consisting solely of chicken and waffles. Football is by far the most popular sport on the planet, and it has long been very hierarchical. For more than a century, Europe and South America have dominated almost every aspect of the sport, despite its ever-expanding interest and popularity throughout other parts of the globe. 
No team from outside of Europe or South America has ever won the FIFA World Cup or even reached a World Cup final, nor has any non-European or South American team ever won the much less prestigious FIFA Club World Cup. While South American football remains a powerhouse on the international stage, with Argentina recently having become the first non-European national team to win the World Cup in 20 years, its club game has struggled to keep pace financially with Europe's leading leagues, particularly since the 1980s and 90s. It's now more than 90 years since a South American club last signed a player for a world record-breaking fee. Almost all of the continent's best players eventually play their domestic football in Europe, and that is reflected in no South American club even having won the Club World Cup for more than a decade. Within a European context, there has been a further concentration of power in the hands of initially just a few leagues and, increasingly now, just the Premier League and about five other clubs, but broadly speaking, the English, Spanish, German and Italian leagues have been on top for the best part of 50 years. During that time, and even before it, there have been several attempts to disrupt that settlement. The first, and arguably still the most notable, came in Colombia during the late 1940s and early 1950s, when the country capitalised upon a footballer's strike in Argentina and expulsion from FIFA to sign some of the world's best players without paying any transfer fees. Because the Campeonato Profesional had been expelled from FIFA, they didn't have to abide by any of the rules and regulations that governed other football leagues, and they soon set about delivering suitcases full of cash to some of the most high-profile players from Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and even Europe. Alfredo Di Stefano, who was arguably the best player on the planet at the time, spent four years starring for Milanarios, meanwhile possibly England's greatest ever defender, Neil Franklin, lasted just six weeks at Milanarios' Bogota rivals Independiente Santa Fe, but that was still enough to stop him from ever playing for England or in the first division ever again. The whole thing went up in a giant ball of flames in the space of about five years, but that didn't stop the United States from pursuing a similar strategy of wild spending and rapid expansion during the 1970s. The signing of Pelé by New York Cosmos in 1975, joined by the likes of Franz Beckenbauer, Johan Cruyff, Gerd Muller and George Best amongst others, was supposed to be the catalyst for transforming the North American Soccer League into the biggest football league on the planet and soccer into the most popular sport in the United States of America. By 1984, the NASL had collapsed under the weight of enormous debt. The MLS, Founded in 1996, with much stricter financial regulations to prevent it from meeting a similar fate, loosened those regulations to bring a 32-year-old David Beckham to Los Angeles in 2009, followed by the likes of Thierry Henry, Kaká, and most recently, of course, Lionel Messi. The gradual progress of Major League Soccer has been less dramatic than the NASL or the El Dorado era of Colombian football, but in signing predominantly older players on big money in the latter stages of their careers, the comparisons with Saudi Arabia's strategy still remain strong. Far less gradual and more dramatic, however, is the comparison that you will hear most often about Saudi Arabia's recent investments in football, and that is with China during the mid-2010s. The most populated nation on Earth and a global superpower, alongside the United States, China's president for life, Xi Jinping, who is himself actually quite a big football fan, decided that the nation's long-term underachievements in football was an issue that the state ought to address. And when Xi and the CCP want something addressed in China, it tends to get addressed. Almost overnight, Chinese money flooded into football both at home and abroad. The likes of West Brom, Wolves, AC Milan, Inter Milan and Granada were all taken over by Chinese businesses or billionaires, and a Chinese consortium even acquired a 13% stake in the City Football Group, which owns 12 football clubs, including Manchester City. Guangzhou Hunda made Dario Conca, an uncapped Argentine who most football fans had never even heard of, the third highest paid player on the planet, 
Shanghai Shenhua were believed to have made Carlos Tevez briefly the highest paid player in the world, and in the 2017 winter transfer window, the Chinese Super League leapfrogged the Premier League as the world's highest spending division. This was serious investment, and all parts of a plan to establish China, initially as one of the leading footballing nations in Asia, reaching the level of South Korea and Japan by 2030, and to have one of the best men's and women's national teams by 2050, capable of hosting and winning the FIFA World Cup. The very visible investment in the likes of Oscar, Tevez, and European club ownership was twinned with less visible but equally radical investment in domestic infrastructure and coaching. It took just two or three years, basically between 2016 to 2018, for that rapid investment to be met with equally sudden divestment, as she and the CCP implemented salary caps, limits on the number of foreign players, and instructed the same Chinese businesses and billionaires who had invested in football under their instructions to stop doing so and even to sell their foreign clubs due to concerns surrounding capital flight, a lack of tangible results, and new priorities. Now the Chinese Super League has all but collapsed, with several of the league's highest spending clubs either having been relegated or outright dissolved, and only a handful of European teams are still Chinese-owned. There are lots of striking similarities between China and Saudi Arabia's investment in football. Both were shocking and unprecedented, they included investment both at home and abroad, and they both had the long-term aim not just of bringing some very famous footballers to their countries, but also of developing competitive teams, leagues, and, perhaps most notably, hosting the FIFA World Cup. Both were also the result of decisions taken by dictators, of course, or at the very least, unelected governments and ruling royal families, but it's also there that you will find some key differences. I have seen it said repeatedly in The Athletic over the past week, that the big difference between China and Saudi Arabia is that the Chinese aren't passionate about football. I don't think that's true. There were several Chinese teams capable of attracting crowds of upwards of 50,000 fans to their home games, and a distinct football culture which predated that massive investment. Saudi Arabia is more passionate about football than China as a whole, or on a per capita basis, no doubt, but in absolute numbers, there are inevitably a great many more passionate football fans in China than there are in Saudi Arabia, or just about anywhere else for that matter. The real difference between Saudi Arabia and China's approaches to football is in terms of how the two countries are run and what their priorities are. Ultimately, Football just wasn't that much of a priority for China, or at least, it wasn't enough of a priority that she and the CCP felt that the circa 2016-17 investments could be justified. When trying to figure out whether Saudi Arabia will reach a similar conclusion in just a few years' time, it's important to consider why they are doing this at all. On that front, there are a few different theories. The most talked about is sports washing, a term which has been popularised over the past decade, but is still often misunderstood, and is typically used within this context to refer to the idea that if the first thing that foreigners think of when they think of Saudi Arabia is either Cristiano Ronaldo or Karim Benzema or football more broadly, instead of, let's say, a genocide in Yemen, public beheadings, or the chopping up of journalists, the kingdom will have secured a PR win. The extent to which this is Saudi Arabia and the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's main aim when it comes to football is, at times I think, a little overblown, though it is certainly true that MBS has been keen to embellish the idea of him being some great liberaliser in the West whilst implementing brutal crackdowns at home, and sport can play a role in softening the image that foreigners have of both him and Saudi Arabia more broadly. More important, perhaps, is the routinely overlooked efforts to sports wash, if you want to use that word, at home rather than abroad. Saudi Arabia is an absolute monarchy. There are no political parties, unions, or other forms of permitted political organisation. The House of Saud restricts almost all political rights and civil liberties, and criticisms of the regime can result in torture, imprisonment, or death. 
During the 2011 Arab Spring, a young boy named Murtagi Kayseri took part in protests in Saudi Arabia, allegedly having shouted, The people demand human rights, into a megaphone down a dusty side street in one of Saudi Arabia's eastern provinces. Kayseri was arrested, accused by the Saudi government of having been part of a terror group and of sowing sedition, and allegedly tortured into providing a false confession. Kayseri was just 10 years old at the time of the protests, and 13 years old when he was arrested, making him one of the world's youngest political prisoners. In 2018, when Kayseri turned 18 years old, Saudi prosecutors indicated that they would be seeking the death penalty, despite Kayseri's age at the time of his alleged offences, accusing him of having thrown Molotov cocktails at a police station after his brother had been killed at a protest. Kayseri's case is not unusual. Last year, Saudi Arabia executed 81 people in a single day, many of whom were also believed to have been government critics, accused of being terrorists by the Saudi government, and then tortured into giving false confessions. But whilst MBS and the Saudi state can pick off tens, hundreds, and perhaps even thousands of dissenting voices, as they have done for generations now, that situation becomes increasingly untenable once you get into the tens or hundreds of thousands. Saudi Arabia has a young population. The average age is just below 31, about 70% of the population are under the age of 35, and it is young people who have the greatest appetite for change. Whilst young people might be more likely to oppose the extreme social and religious conservatism that marks Saudi Arabia out as one of the most conservative countries in the world, they're also often fanatical about football. Keen to avoid future unrest and challenges to their authority, the House of Saud, therefore, is deploying the carrot as well as the stick. On the one hand, if you protest or voice any dissent, be prepared for the most brutal repression imaginable. But on the other hand, if you just want to see some of the best footballers in the world playing in Saudi Arabia, we can also make that happen. Of course, football isn't the only aspect of that strategy, or even the most important one, and we don't have time to get into some of the others, but it is still significant. Equally important, perhaps, is just the practical implications of getting young people more interested in sport, and hopefully more active as a consequence. About 70% of Saudi Arabia's population may be under the age of 35, but roughly 60% of the population is either overweight or obese. That has significant ramifications in terms of productivity and healthcare, in a country where the state provides universal healthcare, and addressing weight and inactivity-related healthcare issues could save the state a fortune in the long run. In 2020, Saudi Arabia's spending on healthcare totaled $49.1 billion. Under current trends, that is predicted to rise to $77.1 billion by just 2027. Sport is also seen as one of the ways in which Saudi Arabia can diversify its economy away from a dependence on oil as part of the country's Saudi Vision 2030 framework, which has been the primary motivation for the rapid expansion of the PIF's investments under MBS. So far, progress on that front has been slow, despite the size of Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund. There are a number of misconceptions more broadly about Saudi Arabia's economy. Saudi Arabia isn't actually that rich. I mean, it is, but it also kind of isn't. There are various ways of measuring the economic strength or output of a country, but by nominal GDP, which is among the most common methods, Saudi Arabia's economy is a little bit smaller than the Netherlands, about half the size of Russia or Canada's, roughly a third of the size of the United Kingdom's, and 4% of the size of the United States. Sure, you might say, but Saudi Arabia is only home to 35 million people, which is true, but Saudi Arabia ranks even lower in terms of GDP per capita. Saudi Arabia ranks 38th in the world by that metric, below Slovenia, Taiwan, and Estonia. All right, Alfie, I hear you say, but what about Saudi Arabia's massive sovereign wealth fund that we keep hearing about, the PIF, 
with its $620 billion in assets under management. That is an important point, and one that I would expect from such an intelligence audience, but it is still less than the sovereign wealth funds of Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, China, and the largest of them all, Norway's, which is worth $1.4 trillion, or in other words, over twice as much as Saudi Arabia's. You heard me right, twice as much. If they wanted to, Norway could use its sovereign wealth fund to take over the country's four biggest clubs, pump them full of cash, and outbid Saudi Arabia for Ronaldo, Benzema, and Kante as a nation of just five million people. But they're too busy wasting it on things like a functioning healthcare system, outstanding public transportation, and a large social safety net. The short-sighted buffoons. They could have signed Sergio Busquets instead. None of this is to say that Saudi Arabia doesn't have the resources to shake up world football, very clearly they do, but the idea that they are uniquely rich or have deeper pockets than any other country on earth is simply misplaced. If China had wanted to commit to their football project and was as committed as Saudi Arabia, they could have outbid them for every club, player, and competition until the end of time. This is a question of priorities, not wealth. In terms of the likelihood of success, even if Saudi Arabia is in it for the long haul and remains extremely committed, unlike China, they still face significant challenges. In terms of prestige, desirability, and domestic standards, in every previous attempt of this ilk, we have seen just how difficult it is to completely reshape the landscape of football. The NASL and Chinese Super League attracted top players, but many of them were nearing the end of their careers, had already secured their legacies within more prestigious competitions, and were, let's be honest, motivated by one last massive payday. So far, the same is true of Saudi Arabia's investment in football. Cristiano Ronaldo is 38, Karim Benzema is 35, and whilst N'Golo Kante is the youngest of the trio at 32, he has had awful injury problems this season, has only played about seven games, and hasn't quite been the same player over the last couple of seasons. If this was Kylian Mbappe, Erling Haaland, and Jude Bellingham that we were talking about, it would be an entirely different conversation. But would any of those players move to Saudi Arabia at this stage of their careers, even if they were offered enough money to form their own private militias? Personally, I have my doubts. Even Harry Kane, who will turn 30 this summer, and is already his club and country's all-time record goalscorer, if he was offered five times as much to play for Al-Hilal next season as he was to play for, let's say, Manchester United or Real Madrid, my suspicion is that he would turn it down, and for very obvious reasons. The profile of the Saudi league is likely to rise along with the calibre of the players and teams within it, but the former will be more gradual. And no point during the careers of the players currently moving to Saudi Arabia will winning the Saudi Pro League be considered on par with winning La Liga or the Premier League, nor the AFC Champions League be considered as prestigious as the UEFA Champions League. Oscar became stupendously rich by joining Shanghai SIPG in 2015, but he never played for Brazil again. Most people haven't seen him play for the last eight years, and many of you probably forgot that he even existed. Inevitably, a lot of players, despite the financial incentives, will consider that a price too great, especially when they are already unfathomably rich and can earn more money than they could ever spend playing in Europe, or even if they are that way inclined, they can just wait until they're into their 30s to make that move and to earn those kinds of sums. Combine that with the fact that plenty of players will find the prospect of living in Saudi Arabia, whether you agree with them or not, less desirable than living in Europe or North America, for example, and you end up, just as the Chinese Super League clubs found, having to pay wildly over the odds in order to convince players to join your clubs, they are sometimes not all that committed because the finances of the deal were their only motivation, and it is extremely difficult to attract the very best players in their early years, or even at the peak of their powers. 
The reason the Premier League is the most watched league in the world isn't just because it has the best teams or the best players. Though, that is arguably now the case. Even when Spanish clubs dominated Europe and star players inevitably ended up joining either Real Madrid or Barcelona, the Premier League was still the most watched and the most lucrative league in the world. Likewise, despite signing some big name players, few people outside of China started watching the Chinese Super League just because of Tevez, Oscar or Hulk. Cristiano Ronaldo and Karim Benzema are of course on a whole different scale in terms of their profile to any players recruited by the Chinese Super League, and they will bring with them individual eyeballs. But history shows us that top heavy leagues tend to come crashing down. Watching Xavi, even in the autumn of his career, strutting around the Qatar Stars League was like watching Pedri if you just plonked him into the Vanarama National League North. In China, the golfing class between domestic and overseas players was so stark that, for anyone who did actually watch it, it was hard to take too seriously. Saudi Arabia isn't China in football terms, they beat Argentina at the World Cup despite finishing bottom of their group, but the Saudi Pro League is ranked outside of the world's top 50 leagues, below the Scottish Premiership, the Championship, and Serie B. Plonking Ronaldo and Benzema in there does not a Premier League make. The Premier League's rise was anything but organic, it was a corporatist breakaway league built on the premise of maximising broadcast and media revenue, and keeping that revenue within the Premier League, rather than redistributing it throughout the pyramid. However, recruitment and investments rose broadly in line with revenue. There were some exceptions like Roman Abramovich's arrival at Chelsea and Abu Dhabi involvement at Manchester City, but it wasn't like the Premier League broke away from the Football League in 1992, signed Marco Van Basten, Jean-Pierre Papin and Haristo Stoichkov, and suddenly became the most popular league in the world overnight. That has never worked, and whilst past performance is not indicative of future results, as the famous disclaimer goes, it is going to take something pretty staggering to end that precedent. In missing out on Lionel Messi, Saudi Arabia's football project has already hit its first rock. The idea, worth 600 million euros a season it would seem, was to have Cristiano Ronaldo at El Nasser and Lionel Messi at Al Hilal, who are the two biggest clubs in Saudi Arabia's capital city of Riyadh, and already have a bitter rivalry, in order to project that rivalry onto the world stage through the medium of the greatest individual rivalry within the sport in recent decades between Messi and Ronaldo themselves. That is the reason why the four clubs to have been taken into PIF ownership are the two biggest from Saudi Arabia's two biggest cities, Riyadh and Jeddah, despite Al Ali only having one promotion from the second tier of Saudi football this season, as the state wants to sell the league around those four super clubs and two mega derbies. Messi has thrown an early spanner in the works of those plans, and whilst Al Ali will still sign a superstar this summer, of that there is no doubt, there is no one out there, other than Ronaldo, who's already playing for their rivals, with a remotely similar profile to Messi. The decision to focus on those four clubs, meanwhile, has upset a number of others, none more so than Al-Shabaab, who have finished in the top four in each of the last three seasons, and felt as though they had turned the traditional big four into a big five. Whilst their rivals sang global superstars, they just lost their own top scorer, Aaron Bupenza, in a $7 million move to MLS outfit FC Cincinnati. In addition to the four clubs taken over by the PIF, four more will receive significant investment from so-called private companies, namely al Qadzia from Saudi Aramco, al Dereya Club from the Dereya Gate Development Authority, al Ula from the Royal Commission, and al Sakor from Neom, which is the company behind the dystopian proposed smart city that some of you will probably have seen. None of those teams compete in the Saudi Pro League though, and given that all of those companies are majority state-owned, it is just state ownership and state investments under a different name. 
For now, most European clubs will see the Saudi Pro League as a useful opportunity to offload older players on big wages, as was the case with the Chinese Super League in the mid-2010s. Though Saudi clubs are yet to actually pay considerable transfer fees, unlike the Chinese Super League, instead targeting free agents. Countless players, meanwhile, will use real or imagined offers from Saudi clubs to bolster their pay packets at home, but fewer will actually make the move. In the case of the Chinese Super League, it was the signing of Alex Teixeira, who was Jurgen Klopp's primary target at Liverpool at the time, and was also sought after by Chelsea, that really made European clubs start to worry, and think that actually this could be some kind of threat. That threat didn't materialise, partly because Teixeira proved to be an exception to, rather than a new rule, and partly because within a couple of years, China had a change of heart when it came to their investment in football. The Saudi Pro League will have its Teixeira moment. The will, probably, be a player who isn't in their 30s and is wanted by a European super club, who turns that offer down in a move to Saudi Arabia instead, and that will worry Europe's elite. Overcoming the hurdle of prestige, desirability, and the sheer amount of time that it will take to establish the Saudi Pro League as a top 10 league in the world, as is Saudi Arabia's aim, let alone one that can rival the Premier League and Champions League, that is a task that will take not just eye-watering amounts of money, but much more than cash alone. That's not to say that it can't be done, just that it is extremely difficult, and the wholesale idea, particularly on this platform, that that shift has already happened is, well, a little bit daft. I have only touched on about 60 to 70% of what I planned for this video, but it's already very long, and I've no doubt that you're all sick of hearing my voice. I really ought to have followed in the true Geordie's footsteps instead, who spent the first two minutes of his Saudi Arabia video by doing a gambling advert, six minutes just googling which players had been offered contracts by Saudi clubs, and what they were worth, and going, whoo, and then the last couple of minutes saying that Saudi Arabia will get everything that they want because they are so powerful and no one will watch the Premier League anymore if the best players go to Saudi Arabia. Brilliantly insightful stuff. A real gift to the YouTube community, I'm sure that you would agree. Anyway, I'm sure that we'll return to this topic at some stage, and if you're not sick of my voice, I would recommend my previous video about the structure and history of Saudi football more broadly, which I will leave a link to at the end of this video, and in which I was just as remarkably prescient as you have all come to expect. Thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Apparently that is helpful in some way. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure, of course, it goes without saying, that you have notifications turned on both of this channel and my backup channel, both of which should be on your screens or about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos, one of which I just mentioned, and another one which YouTube's algorithm has decided that you might be interested in. Are they right? I don't know. Anyway, you can also find me on uh, Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.